I'm John DeGarmo. I've been a foster parent for 13 years now. Uh, I work in a school system during the day, but on the weekends I, I go around the nation traveling and, and working with foster parents, training foster parents. I've truly dedicated my life to helping foster parents, foster children, and beyond that, helping the general public, the general society, understand more about foster care. Now before I was a foster parent, I knew very, very little about foster care. I had some misconceptions. I thought, well, foster kids were bad kids and foster parents were weird people. I got one thing right. Foster parents are a little bit weird. We have to be weird to do what we do. My first child died of a disease called anencephaly, or, or anencephaly as I pronounce it. It's a condition or, or a condition where the brain or the skull never really form. So after my wife uh, gave birth to our child after 92 hours of labor, I did not grieve properly. My wife did, I did not. I immersed myself in my work. I just refused to, to accept it. Years later, after my own three children were, were born and they were healthy, I was working in a school system, a rural school system, and I was noticing a lot of children coming into my classroom who had a lot of issues. And I asked myself, I kept asking myself, why are they acting this way? And then I met some of their birth parents and saw abuse and neglect and abandonment. So I went back to my wife and said, listen, we've lost a child. How can we help other children? So at that point, we became foster parents. And through the years, I, I wrote my doctorate on foster care. I've written several books on it. and. Uh, 47 children later, we've adopted three kids from foster care, and I just tried to devote all of my time. I felt led to, to help foster care. Foster parenting is, for me, the hardest thing I've ever done. It's a 24-hour day, seven-day a week, 365-day job a year. At the same time, it is by far the most important job I have ever done or that I believe I could ever do. It is the opportunity for me to bring children into my home and my, my whole family's affected by it. We, we've grown so much by it. At the same time, we're hoping to help these children. So for prospective foster parents, they need to ask themselves a few questions. They need to ask themselves, are, are, are both partners or both spouses on board? Both have to be on board. This is a full commitment by both members of a, of a relationship. They need to ask themselves, do they have a support system? Foster parents need support. There are resources out there, sure, but they need to have some type of support group, whether it's a church, whether it's a foster parent association, whether it's family members, they need to have some type of support uh, as they foster. They also need to ask themselves if they have biological children in their own home, are the children prepared for this as well? Are the children ready for it? So there's a number of things they need to ask themselves before they begin the process of training to become a foster parent. After I did my six months of training as a foster parent, I was so anxious, so excited about my first call as a foster parent. And we were so excited. It was 10.30 at night. We had a four-year-old girl come in our house with a six-month-old sister. And we're just so excited. Within the first 20 minutes of the child being in my home, I realized, whoa, I am not prepared for this. I was not trained for this. Um, you know, and I look back upon that and I laugh. But at the time, I realized this is going to be something different than I expected. When you bring children into your own home that have various forms of trauma and who have suffered various forms of abuse, it can be very, very challenging at times. Sometimes as a foster parent, you are not prepared for this. For myself, 47 different children in my home, every time a child comes into my house, it's a brand new experience. And I have to react to that, re react and learn to that new experience each time. It's never the same. Children in foster care, to be sure they need stability and they need security, but most of all, they need unconditional love. Does this love heal all wounds and, and fix all things? It does not. But this is what the children need the most. They need the foster parents to love them unconditionally. Now, there are times where foster parents may have to seek out therapeutical help. They may actually have to go to a group therapy session with their foster child, and that's, that's, uh, that's very important. But again, this is what the children need the most. They need the love that a foster parent can give them. One of our earlier placements was a four-year-old boy and his six-month-old sister. His six-month-old sister was a meth baby. It was my first experience as uh, having a meth child in my house. And she was going through the withdrawal process of going through meth. And for her, and for many crack or meth babies who are going through withdrawal systems, it's a process where they have to wean the drugs out of their body. And that looks like just screaming, non-stop screaming as the drugs are weaning through the body and the child is racked with so much pain. So I'm holding this poor baby, and my wife is getting, giving the four-year-old brother a bath, perhaps his first bath in a very, very long time, perhaps his first bath ever. And my wife calls me in the bathroom, and I could hear the anxiety and the urgency in her, in her voice. So I went to the bathroom, 
And there she was, and tears are just streaming down her face. And I, I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she just pointed to the child's head. She had no words. I said, what is it? And she parted back his hair, and there were these tiny black circles on his head. They were cigarette burns from his mom. Now, why would his mother burn him with cigarette burns on his scalp, the hair? to hide the evidence. But that's not the only place she had the evidence. He had cigarette burns on his tongue, on the roof of his mouth, and on his genitals. From his mom! The person who's supposed to protect him from all evils is burning her son with cigarette burns on his tongue and his genitals. This is not uncommon with children in foster care. When the children come into your home, they have these traumas that you just can't gloss over and fix very, very quickly. Now, I have three biological children. I also have three adoptive children from foster care. The issues that my own biological children face are far different than the issues that my, that my foster children face. It's night and day. At the same time, both children need love. Both children, whether it's adoptive, foster, or biological, they need to be loved the same. They need to be on equal footing. So I cannot love my own biological children differently than I love my foster kids because my foster children will recognize that. So we need to incorporate all those children in unconditional love. When a child comes into my home, they become my child. I see, I see no difference between bi biological, foster, adoptive, and I will fight for the rights of all those children equally. At the same time, I have to put, many times, a lot more effort into the foster children because of the traumas they face. We live in a, in, a, in a society today, in a world today, that is very, very different than when I grew up in. We live in a society today where I live in an online world. My children inhabit an online world, which is a very, very different thing. You know, there was a joke a long time ago that if you, had a, you didn't know how to record on your VCR, you just gave it to your child and they would fix it for you. Well, today, if you don't know how a phone works or a computer works, you give it to a child and they'll fix it like that. Our children inhabit this online world. But for children in foster care, there are particular dangers that children face in foster care. There are, besides all the regular dangers of online technology and social networking, there are sexual predators who are specifically targeting children in foster care, and they can do it very, very easily. There is a very easy fashion to do it. Um, at this, at, along with this, human sex traffickers are also targeting and luring in children from foster care. Why do they do this? Why do the sexual predators and the human sex traffickers track, uh, targeting children in foster care? Because they are the most vulnerable. Children in foster care need one thing. They look for one thing. They look to belong, they look to be accepted, and they want to be loved. So many times they go online looking for acceptance, looking to belong and looking to be loved. And they find this love from these people who are luring them in. For a child who has only experienced abuse, sexual abuse all of her life, human sex trafficking, child pornography will be her norm, unfortunately. Child pornography is the fastest growing internet business today. The fastest growing internet business is child pornography. And many of these children in the United States are from foster care. So how do, we, how do we stop this? You have to be diligent. Foster parents have to be diligent and they have to be aware. There are ways to block it with, with um, software programs and with browsers and with filters. But more importantly, those change all the time. So foster parents need to be one step ahead of the change. They need to be consistently aware of what's going on. A blind eye to this is going to end up the result of a child in child uh, pornography in human sex trafficking, child, uh, children pornographers, uh, I'm sorry, children, children in prostitution as young as the age of 9 or 10 or 11. Recently I, I, I read uh, some reports that really disturbed me. I'm a big sports buff. I love sports. I love football. The biggest week of child um, prostitution in the United States is the week of the Super Bowl where child predators and human traffickers are shipping in children for the entertainers and the athletes and the people who are attending the Super Bowl. This should be a big wake-up call to America where our smallest little children are being used for sex, which just breaks my heart so much. I speak to foster parents a lot across the nation and they continue to tell me about a, uh, a concern that's, that's really arisen in the last couple of years and that is biological family members 
contacting their children, our foster children, through online devices, through a laptop, through a, a cell phone, whatever it may be, and these contacts are unsupervised and they're unmonitored. Now, as a foster parent myself, when a, one of my foster children goes to a visitation with their, with their family members, I am so insistent that it's monitored and that is supervised by somebody who is watching over the children. When our foster children are being, uh, when they are being contacted by their biological parents through these online devices, many times it is not supervised and sometimes that can lead to a very, very dangerous route. I in fact interviewed a foster parent recently whose foster child was kidnapped by her biological mother and her stepfather. The stepfather was a sexual predator, a registered sexual predator who had raped children. This foster child was contacted on her cell phone by her biological mother. They set up a meeting one time after a football game on a Friday evening and off they went. Nobody knew. No one had a clue because again, the use of a cell phone was unsupervised. Now, I am, I am a strong believer that no child needs a cell phone before the age of 13. If a foster child has a cell phone, the foster parents and the caseworker must have the password. Now I hear from sometimes from people, you're invading their privacy. I say rubbish. You are making sure the child is protected because you don't know who is reaching out to that child. You don't know what's being said to that child and you don't know what's being set up for that child. Foster children often feel they have no control over any aspect of their life. When they're taken from their mother and they're taken from their father and they're taken from their siblings and their stuffed animals and their toys and everything that they know and they're thrust into a strange house late, late at night with strange people and told, here's your new house, here's your new family. The next day they go to a strange school with strange students and strange classes and they just think, I want to go home. Well, they have control of one thing and that is online. They go online to, to have control and to seek out whatever they're looking for, acceptance, belonging, love. So foster children will often go online and they express themselves online. They express their frustrations, they express their sadness, they express their hopes. Now this can be a good thing, but it can also be a dangerous thing. So there are some things that foster parents need to do. To begin with, if, they, if the foster parents believe that the child is mature enough and responsible enough to have a social network site, foster parents need to teach their foster child how to set up a profile. And sometimes I encourage foster parents to have the child set up two profiles. A profile that has their real name, and with this real name, this is used to contact maybe former foster parents, or maybe grandparents, or maybe the child is split up from their siblings, so they can contact and communicate with their siblings. But this has to be co closely, heavily monitored. And then the foster child can set up a false profile with a false name. And here they can go and they can talk and communicate with their friends and they can surf the internet, so to speak, and they can browse and look around without fear of being contacted or, or um, lured in by sexual predators or biological family members. At the same time, this false profile also must be um, heavily monitored by both the foster parents and the caseworkers. Now some foster parents tell me, well I don't have time to look at my child's cell phone or laptop every week. I can only do it once a month. I tell them, you have to be consistent. This is a diligent process that you must be doing. You have to do this every single evening. You are the only person who is watching out for the safety of this child. And if you let a child predator slip by who has sent them a sext message perhaps, then that child is going to be in a, in a whole world of danger. I've dedicated my life to helping foster children foster parents and the general public understand more about foster care and I've done that a number of ways. To begin with I, I've written several books. My first book is called Fostering Love One Foster Parent's Journey. It is a memoir so to speak of my first 10 years as a foster parent. It, it's a very honest account of what a, being a foster parent is in the 21st century. I, I share my frustrations with the system, my frustrations with the children, the challenges that sometimes happens for my family, the joys and successes as well as the grief and the sorrow that I felt as a foster parent. It's a book that a foster parent will pick up, will pick up read, and uh, they'll, they will laugh and cry because they relate to the stories and then they give it to a friend or a family member who has no idea what foster parenting is about and say this is what I do. When I did my research for my doctorate on foster care I remembered there's no how-to book to be a foster parent. So I wrote a book called The Foster Parenting Manual 
which is a book designed specifically to answer all the questions anybody might have about foster parenting, from before the child comes into the home until after the child comes in, and everything in between from adoption to working with caseworkers to working with birth parents to grief and trauma to setting up rules, you name it, it's in that book. And there, there's one book I'm really, really proud of it's called A Different Home, A New Foster Child Story. And it's a book from the perspective of a seven-year-old girl who comes into care and she has all those questions. Why am I here? When do I go home? When do I see mommy next? Questions that I really struggle with as a foster parent. How do you answer those questions for a child? And in this book, this girl cries herself to sleep many nights as they have in my own home. And by the end of the story, she realizes this is a different house, it's a different family, but I'm going to be okay. So it's a book designed for caseworkers, social workers, and foster parents to pull off the shelf every time a child's placed into a new home and to read to the child because, again, it's in the child's perspective, and it helps to ease some of the anxieties and answer some of the questions. Uh, Keeping Foster Children Safe Online is a book specifically designed to help foster parents and caseworkers protect their child, whether it's foster, adoptive, or biological, but foster children in general from all the dangers out there of online technology, from gaming, from movies, from sexual predators, you name it, it's out there. Uh, I also work on, uh, I also travel across the nation helping foster parents, delivering training sessions. One of my more popular training sessions at the moment is one that's dear to my heart, grief and loss for foster parents. Because when these children come into our home and we love them unconditionally and they become our children and then all of a sudden within a phone call, they're gone the next day do we grieve for them? Absolutely. It's as if we lost our own child. It's a, it's a tremendous time of, of loss and grief for foster parents. So that's just one of the many training sessions I deliver for foster parents. On my website, you can find training webinars. Because if you're like my wife, who says December 29th or December 30th, I don't have enough hours. I've got to go online to do training webinars. So there are some training webinars on my, on my website where foster parents can get certification for their um, certification, so to speak. I'm also a foster parent coach. If you're familiar with what a parent coach is, well, I'm a foster parent coach. I work with foster parents through Skype or through emails or whatever it may be, uh, and we work together trying to help the children. So there are many different aspects to how I have devoted my life to helping foster parents. Before I was a foster parent, I knew a little about foster care system, and I really wasn't too concerned or aware of the suffering. 13 years later, 47 children through my home, three children adopted, I have I have become a completely different person. I am so aware of the suffering that children go through and it, it breaks my heart. Every time a child comes into my home, my heart grows a bit bigger. You know, the heart of a foster parent is often like a quilt. It goes larger and larger and we keep having to patch it so many times because we, our heart keeps breaking for the children. My heart breaks for the children when they come into my home because of the traumas they have faced. My heart breaks for the children when they go back from my home and the times that sometimes I'm very happy because they go home to a, a reunified family or to an adoptive family and sometimes my heart is broken because I simply miss the children in my home. Uh, how, how am I different as a person? I believe that I have just had, I have not only a more awareness but much more compassion for my fellow human being and I have wanted to reach out and serve other people. I've wanted to, I've, I've thought how can I help children in need? People can contact me a number of ways. They can contact me on my Facebook page, Dr. John DeGarmo. They can get me on Twitter, of course. My email address, drjohndegarmo at gmail.com. And then on my website, my website, Dr. John DeGarmo Foster Care. And on my website, they'll find all the articles I've written for various magazines. They'll find a weekly video segment called Foster Care 101. They'll find other videos, uh, webinars, resources, you name it, it's all there. I've, uh, again, I've asked myself as a foster parent, what did I wish I knew? What do I need to know? And then I've gone and done research on it, and then I deliver it to foster parents.